Hello class, this is CSE 5250, section 60, week 7, fall 2023. I'm also going to be sharing this with the in-person section of the class, section 1. So, this is also CSE 5250, section 1, week 7, fall 2023. Uh, the reason why I have both classes having the same video is because there's a lot of important content in here that I want to get through, including a step-by-step -step process of building up the program necessary for your midterm project. And now, and although I am literally giving you the code for that, a lot of the work for that program is still going to be running the program and see what kind of execution time you get. I'll, but I'll get into that a little bit later. First, Let's look at how the sieve of Eratosthenes works. So, if I have the slideshow, we begin with an example. All the numbers from 2 to 50. We start. So, how do we. So, what is the sieve of Eratosthenes anyway? This is an algorithm that you start with a list of numbers from, say, to the sum desired maximum number. We call it, we're gonna call it search max from here on out. So we start from two to sum search max, and then we run the algorithm on this list of numbers. And at the end, once we're done, all we have are the prime numbers that were in the list. So if you can imagine a sieve, like a physical sieve, and all these numbers are like bits of gravel that fall into the sieve. What remains in the sieve is all the non-prime numbers, and what falls out through the bottom are the prime numbers. So let's begin. We start at 2, and then we go up from 2, and we actually start crossing out numbers here. So what happens is this. We cross out numbers that are multiples of 2, so 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, and so on. Those are multiples of 2, and because they're multiples of another number, they cannot be prime numbers. So we cross out those numbers. We go from there to the next number, that is the number 3. We start at 3, go up by 3, so we are at the number 6. And then starting from there, we cross out multiples of the number 6. So 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24. Note that some of those numbers have already been crossed out as multiples of 2. What we're doing here is crossing out multiples of 3 that haven't been crossed out as multiples of 2. See how this works? We are going through the list and looking for numbers, we're looking for prime numbers, and we're crossing them out. So on one on the one hand, we're going through the list and looking for prime numbers. On the other hand, we're crossing out multiples of that prime number. So our next number is the number four. But look, it's already crossed out. When we get that situation, if we are to encounter a number, if we're to encounter a number that's already been crossed out, we skip it and go to the next one. So the next one is the number 5. So we go up 5 to the next number, that's the number 10. And then we start crossing out multiples of 5, so 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and so on. You'll, you'll see that I have a few numbers already circled, but... I'll get to those in a bit. So after we cross out those numbers, we go to the number 6 and then cross that out. But that's... No, we go to the number 6 and cross out multiples of 6, but that 6 is already crossed out, so we go to the number 7. So we start at 7, and we start crossing out multiples of 7. So, so we start at 7, go up 7 to the number 14, and start crossing it and all numbers after that that are multiples of 7. So 14, 21, 28, 35, 42. 49, and then we go to the next number, so that would be 8, but it's crossed out. 
and then the next number, but that's crossed out. The next number is 10, but that's crossed out. The next number is 11, so we can cross out multiples of 11. So 22, 33, 44, but we hit an interesting point here. If we were to cross out the multiples of 11, all of them have been crossed out. So this is a mathematical observation that I, that's out of the scope of this video to prove. When we are looking for prime number candidates, when we're going through this list of looking for numbers that haven't been crossed out, we don't have to go through the you don't have to go through the entire list. What we can do is cheat. We can stop not at the search max of 50, but at the square root of the search max. If we even if we didn't know that that was a cheat that we can use, consider what would happen if we kept going anyway? You would find that there are optimizations to be had. Or rather, you can stop early in your search for prime numbers. So basically, consider the number 29. The multiple, the next multiple of 29 is 58. So that's 29 times 2. That is larger than the number 50. So we could say we can stop at We can stop looking for primes when we start looking for uh, multiples of, basically, we can stop halfway in the list. So we could have stopped at the number 25, or I should say the next number after that, that's the number 26. We could have stopped there and still would have been able to find all the prime numbers. But the fact but the mathematical fact is this. We can simply stop at the square root of the search max. We don't have to go through the entire search max. But we do need to go up to the search max when we are crossing out multiples of prime numbers. I'll get a little bit into the code in a bit, but this is the basis of your midterm project. You will be writing the set of Eratosthenes. You will be parallelizing the set of Eratosthenes and then you will be benchmarking it to see what kind of execution times you get with every possible, with all sorts of combinations of search max and thread number. So, all throughout the course, we have been looking at how to parallelize programs, and the hope is this. If we have a program that can be parallelized, the hope is that we can reduce the execution time of that program. That's the main point of parallel programming. The thing is, we have a few problems that arise when you try to parallelize programs, and we encounter certain programs that cannot be parallelized at all. So that was chapter 5 and chapter 4. Now we're trying to take on a more practical approach by trying out one program for ourselves writing it, parallelizing it, and see whether we get a speed up. You will be using OpenMP, but if you are confident in your ability to use pthreads, then you can use that instead. In fact, if you are confident in your ability to write the entire program by yourself, then you can just, you can basically feel free to basically start writing away. But just in case you need help or need a little further guidance, then this, then the rest of the video is basically a step-by-step -step process of writing the entire set of Eratosthenes. But before I get to that, here is the entire assignment in instruction form. You have three parts to this pro for this entire midterm project. You're gonna write the set of Eratosthenes. You are to submit a s the source code of your program. This is the multi-threaded set of Eratosthenes. I require you to submit at least one screenshot of the program running. That's part one, that's 30 points. Part two is you're gonna fill out a table that looks like this, that has different combinations of thread counts and search maximums. In each cell 
in this table, you are to write down not the prime numbers, but rather the execution time. How long did it take for the program to find all the prime numbers? Now, this program, or rather, this table, this is just a starting point. So you can start with this table, or you can expand the table as much as you want for any search maximum, for any search maximum and the thread count that you want. If you can, I would encourage I would encourage you to push your system as much as you can. So that's part two. You are benchmarking your program. Part three is this. There are two questions for you to answer. Do you think there is a thread count that consistently had the best results? And how big of a search max did we do we need before parallelization starts to have a benefit? So that is the entire assignment. This will be due sometime in week nine. So you have about two weeks to do the entire project. If we need extra time, we can talk about that then. But this is the entire but this is the entire midterm assignment. Yeah, we have the set of Eratosthenes that you have to write. You have the set you have the sieve of Eratosthenes that you're going to parallelize, and then finally you are going to test the sieve on different combinations of thread count and search maximums to see some sort of pattern where you will have some performance gains in using different thread counts. But according to um, Amdahl's law, there is going to be a point of diminishing returns. Additionally, due to the overhead of parallelizing code, you may have workloads so small that they might not be conducive to parallelization at all. In fact, at worst, it might even make the program run slower. So your job is to find at what point does it help to parallelize the code? And where, if anywhere, does it make sense to have... No, what, what I mean is... So one question is, how many primes do we have, how many numbers do we have to search for until we have parallelization start to have a benefit? And can we say that there is a thread count that consistently had the best results? Anything before that might not have any time difference, but anything after that will have diminishing returns. So that is the entire assignment. Everything after this point is basically a step-by-step -step process of building up the entire set of Eratosthenes. So if you'd like guidance on that, then let's continue with the video. So this is the entire program already. This is the entire program for the sieve of Eratosthenes. Bare bones, nothing special about it, just the sieve that can search for prime numbers up to a specific search maximum. Let's try it out. Enter the magic of writing this ahead of time. I have the program already written up right here. So this is all a CPP program. Or rather, it's a C program, but I wrote it all this is a C program, but I saved it in a CPP file. So I am going to compile this using only PowerShell. If you are on any other, if you are on a Mac or a Linux system, and you can't find any other way to compile it, fall back to using only uh, Linux commands to compile your program. So, let's open folder in File Explorer. We have two folders in here. I want to open this one because that's where our source code lives. And that's where we have a pre-compiled Civ program. Let's delete that for now. And I'm going to type in PowerShell in the address bar. Move the PowerShell window over here. 
I had already typed up the command to compile this a few times before, just for testing purposes. And even though this is a even though this is a CPP file that we're using as input, it will compile it as C code. So if you had written this in a .c file, just this would work if we have the C file on us. So for now, I'm going to use a CPP file, but I'm going to run it through the C compiler instead. So the PowerPoint also has the exact compile commands for this. As I said, there are two options for writing the entire Sith. The one is to use C code alter web. The other one is to start using C++ code, because here's the thing. We can use C++ with OpenMP. The only difference is how we compile it. So if we are using a Linux terminal or PowerShell to compile our programs, then we are using the GCC compiler. Otherwise, if we're using C++ code, we use the G++ compiler. All the other parameters are the same, except for maybe the file name. And the, or rather, the file extension for the file name. So, with all that in mind, let's compile this program and see what we get. And if I type in dot slash, because I had typed in sieve to be my executable's file name. If I do dot slash, if I type in dot slash sieve, press enter, I get all the prime numbers. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 79. 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, and so on. From personal experience in from experience in teaching this class several times before, as well as of all things looking at microtonal music theory that has prime numbers everywhere, I can recognize the first couple prime numbers already by heart. So three two three five seven eleven thirteen seventeen nineteen, for example. We can for example, double check to make sure that all of these are prime by checking each number individually. Say we run it to an, through an online calculator. But from this point forward, let's assume that all of this is correct. So, one thing we can do is increase the search max to whatever we want. So say we type in the number 5,000. We already got some problems. Function uses 20,000 bytes of stack. Exceeds analyzed stack size of 16,384. Consider moving some data to the heap. Would it still work if I tried to do a search max of 5,000? Let's see. I have to recompile the program. And let's run it again. It works. So 4,999 is also a prime number. Let's say I tried 10,000. Recompile the program again. And run it again. It took a little bit more time, but some of that time is basically time needed to print out all the numbers. One really torturous thing you can do is type in something like 1E9. That is 1 billion. We recompile the program and run it again. And now our program is taking forever. Let's stop it. Okay, so. To help us streamline the process of testing out a program, and maybe to get this thing, to, maybe to get this warning out of the way, what we're going to do is add a few changes to our program. So the PowerPoint slide has those changes. Let's look at them. So. Here are two options, and here are the compile commands, depending on which option we want. Let's go to option one for now. We stick with all C code. 
So here is our first modification. We're going to have the search max be passed in as a command line argument. And then, using that, we allocate memory for an array that will contain all of our prime numbers. But then at the end of that program, we need to free up that memory so we don't have a memory leak. So here are the main co code changes and additions underlined in red. So search max is no longer a constant int, it's just an int. And it is going to be assigned a value that was passed in as a command line argument. Our primes is now a pointer to a block of allocated memory that we allocate using the malloc function. At the end, we free the memory that we had allocated to avoid memory leaks. So those are the three main changes that we, sh we should try out with our program. For this, we need to include a new library, include standard library.h. Next, we take out that const keyword. Next, next, str toll. Oh yeah, we also need this int argc character star argv in the parentheses. So that way we get our uh, command line arguments. So argv1 null and 10. So now we have our search max. The next thing to do is to convert this from an integer to an int star. Then we allocate memory for that. So primes equals, we cast to it, we, we write in parentheses int star because we're casting it to that data type malloc. And then we type in search max times size of int. This will allocate memory so we can, this will allocate memory for us to write our primes in that, well, array. All these, all of this code can be left as is. It's just that after that we have to call free primes. That way we free up the memory that we use. So now we have that. Let's recompile our program again. I have PowerShell already opened up. Let's recompile, rerun it. The prime numbers are, and the program reached. And that was because I never entered a command line argument. This program now requires command line arguments. So I'm going to type in dot slash sieve 1000. And it works the same as before. If I type in a million, it's going to take some time to write all the prime numbers because, well, this is a lot. But at the end of the program, at the end of all this, it will finish, it will have written out all the prime numbers from one to a million. Let's sit back and relax and watch this thing finish up. We're at the 700 thousands already. Ah, there we are. 999,983 is a prime number according to this, to this program. Look at all those primes. So big that it... <laughs> all our previous stuff is gone. So, clear. So let's maybe do a modest 10,000 instead. It took no time to, well, calculate the primes, but it took a while to write them all on the screen. So, oh, 9,001 is a prime number. It's over 9,000. Anyway, it took us a while to write it all, or rather, it took us a while for the program to write it all on the screen. So one thing I will advise, this print function here, comment that out. We don't really need that going forward. If anything, it's going to hold us back. You could instead rewrite it so that we instead have it print out. Hey, the program this the program found this many prime numbers. That's one way we can that's one way we can repurpose that for loop, but for our purposes, I'm just going to comment it out. The main point is not so much finding prime numbers. The main point is finding how long it took to find them. 
So, with this, we can now look for prime numbers to up to any arbitrary search maximum. That's not the only change we need. Let's go back to the slides. We also want the execution time. So there is one way of finding the execution time. I have a link to a Stack Overflow page explaining exactly that. This method will get us the seconds that the, operates, that the operating system has spent running the process. So this is a single process that has multiple threads. How long did it take for the OS to run that program? So here is yet another modified program. I'll just show you all the modifications to this. So before we run the main code, we call clock. We need time.h for this. But once we have that, call clock and save that in a variable called begin. The data type is clock underscore t. At the end, we call clock again, but we store that in another clock underscore t variable called end. Then we use end and begin to calculate the time spent, the time that the operating system spent running that program. So this is going to be a double, data type double, variable name time spent. We're going to do end minus begin, cast to double, and then we're going to divide it by clocks per second. And then we're going to print f. The program took percent f seconds to run, and that percent f is our time spent. So let's add those additions to our program. OK. So let me just move all, all these windows out of the way. And now we have two more additions. I'm going to type in include time.h. I am going to add in clock underscore t begin equals clock. I'm going to type this, and right, bef and right before the return zero and right after the end of the program, I'm going to type in clock t end equals clock. I'm going to calculate based off of that, based on that slide, double time spent equals double and minus be and minus begin divided by clocks per second print f the program took percent f seconds to run and then time spent. And that's it. Right? Okay, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything. I expected a semicolon somewhere. The error went away. Okay, with PowerShell still open, I'm going to clear all of that and recompile the command, re recompile the program once again. It worked. And if I do dot slash sieve 10,000, instead of printing out any prime numbers, it will instead tell us how long it took the program to run. So here it took what? 0.001 seconds to run. So what is that, one millisecond? Let's stress test it by say, search for prime numbers up to a million. And now it took 0.19 seconds to run. Let's do it again. So this is 10 million, and it took about a quarter of a second to run. Let's do it again with 100 million, and you can already see the time increase. So that took 
nearly three seconds to run. This is a billion. Let's see how long that takes. It's you can probably you can probably imagine the program's like grinding right now. I'm not sure if it's possible for me to see what it looks like on say task manager, but if we just leave that to do its thing, how long will it take? 32 seconds! <laughs> now, one thing I managed to fail to mention about this benchmark is you want to get an average execution time. So for that, you're gonna have to run the program at least five times until you get, until you have enough data to do an average. More is better, but I say at least five trials for each combination of uh, dread and search maximum. So yeah, your table is going to have execution times, but it's preferred to have average execution times, because running one program Running a program once isn't enough. We would have to run it several times to know for sure how long it took for the program to run. And there we go. Clear. And let's continue. So now we have all of that, and we have modified the program so that it can search up to any arbitrary search max. We have modified the program so instead of printing out prime numbers, it prints out an execution time. Now, we are going to parallelize it. We're going to use the command line arguments again so we can tell the program how many numbers, how many threads it should run it. So, this program is actually going to accept two command line arguments. The first one is the search max, the second one is the thread count. We are going to parallelize the for loop, and we're going to parallelize it the following way. In classes past, I simply just showed this as saying pragma omp parallel 4 right before the inner for loop, but per the textbook, that's actually an inefficient way of doing it. Hold on. Here's the reason. If we have pragma omp parallel 4 on this line, it's going to fork that for loop. It's going to fork the process, it's going to fork the main thread into a team of threads and then they're gonna join back once the for loop is done. But it's going to do that every time this for loop is called by the outer for loop. So, instead of doing that, instead of having a fork and join for every for loop iteration in which we have a current prime whose multiples we have to cross out, we're going to make the entire for loop, the whole for loop, the outer for loop, I mean. We're going to enclose that in a parallel section, but we are not going to parallelize the outer for loop. This way, we create a team of threads, but they're not going to do anything yet. Those threads are not doing anything yet. They only do something once we add in a second directive, pragma omp4. Using the team of threads that we have already created, we are going to have them run this for loop in parallel. So that's it. Those are the two, those are the final two additions for our program. So now we can run the program with any number of threads up 
and search up to any maximum number we want. So that's the entire program. I'll show you the C++ option in a bit, but because we're so close to final to the final program already, I'm going to write in the final editions of code. Pragma OMP parallel and then num threads thread count. I am going to enclose the whole block of code. I'm going no, I'm going to enclose this whole block of code in parentheses. So all of this, this entire section of code, that is an entire parallel section. I'm going to go down here and type in another pragma. Pragma OMP4. This is a parallel for loop, but it uses the team of threads that was already created when we entered this parallel section here. So, during the, so basically, those threads are going to fork, run the whole for loop, and then join. It's not going to fork and join here. It's not going to fork and join every time we have to call this inner for loop. It's going to fork and join once. We're not done yet. We, because we're now using OpenMP, we need to include OMP.h. We also need a thread count. So int thread count equals str toll argv2 and then null 10. And that's it. That is the final program. So let's run it. We'll run it. Uh, Recompile the program. Some stuff is missing. Oh, dir. This is an error. That pragma omp4 should go before the for loop, not before the if. There we are. Fixed it. And now we're ready. Compile. It compiled successfully. So let's run the sieve with say. We're gonna run the sieve looking for prime numbers up to 10 million with one thread. And it took about 0.2 seconds to run. If we run it a few more times, it took about that much time. Let's run it with 100 threads, and it took more time. And that's one thing that you might see happen when you parallelize your program. Because we have so many threads, at some point we might have diminishing returns, but at worst, we might have, we might get worse execution times. Let's do 50 threads and see if that does any better. No, it does not do any difference. So, so instead, I'm gonna do like one billion. And I'm going to try a hundred threads. I'm looking for prime numbers up to a billion. And I'm using 100 threads to run this program. I don't know how well this... I don't know how well this will turn out on the video. But I just got an error from OBS saying that the thing was overloaded. And that took us 17 seconds where previously when it took... When previously, with one thread, it took like 32 seconds. So, we did get an improvement. Let's try a more modest number, say 100 million. So, primes up to 100 million, and we'll try it with one thread. And it takes... 2.5 seconds to run. If we do it with 100 threads... It took 2 seconds to run. Will it work with 1,000 threads? It, it, it went, it made it worse. So a thousand threads made it worse. But will it work with, say, 50 threads? There we go. We have an instance where 
we have threat counts, and it finally decreased the execution time. Not by a lot, but the but imagine the context. If you are running this program only a few times a day, what's a few second? What's a few fractions of a second gonna matter? But if this is a program that was to be run on a supercomputer or a distributed system or what have you, and it's running like the same function tens, thousands, millions of times a day, maybe mil or perhaps e even maybe, maybe millions of times a minute, then that kind of time adds up. The time savings adds up wherever you can make, wherever you can shave off even just a few milliseconds of time. But now we have the final program. You have the final program now. So if you've made it this far, pat yourself on the back. Because we've did it. And the hard part is, well, benchmarking this benchmarking this bad boy. Alright, so this is the final program that I want you to have for your midterm project. The final section of the PowerPoint is basically briefly describing the C++ option. So maybe you want to write this program using a few libraries from C++. So I will briefly describe what those libraries are. So here we're going to change the program just a little bit from the C version, and we are going to get the execution time in microseconds. So that's one one millionth of a second. So here, instead of going through a step-by-step -step process, just know that this is the same program as before, but with two changes. I'm using a vector, and I'm using standard chrono for getting our execution times. So. I'm just gonna show you the entire kind of completed program, but if you want to program this on your own, if you, if you ever need help on this, you can just fall back on the PowerPoint slides or the video. This is going to be avail available to both sections after all, so all this code here is identical to the equivalent C code, except we're using standard chrono and standard vector. So I'm going to go through it uh, piece by piece. So those are the first 11 lines. Here's the next section. We have this for our begin variable. So this begin variable is of data type standard chrono steady clock time point. I'm writing auto instead, not because it's short for that standard chrono steady clock time point, but rather I'm basically telling the compiler, here, you figure out the data type. <laughs> so that's why it's auto begin. So we're, so we're calling steady clock now. And that's going to give us a timestamp of when we called now. So that's the first change. The second change is this. Instead of allocating memory for the primes array, primes is now a vector. And it's simply standard vector int primes search max. So what this means here is we have a vector of integers called primes, and it is full of search max elements. All the parallel code is the same. And because we're not using the malloc function anymore, it's no longer necessary to call free primes anymore because we never called the malloc function. So we can just call it, comment that out. Here's the end of the program. We call now, we, we call steady clock now again, and save that in a variable called end. I should probably go back. It should actually be something like standard chrono steady clock now, but I am using a namespace to basically save my fingers. So we are using namespace standard chrono, so we don't have to type out that monster line here. So standard chrono steady clock time point. So instead of writing out standard chrono steady clock time point now, 
we, we can just write in something like steady clock now. But because we have the auto data type, we can just say auto end. The compiler will figure out what kind of data type that is. And then we can save to end whatever steady clock now returns. And then using that information for end and begin, we can cast that to microseconds. So here is how we calculate the execution time. Auto time spent equals duration cast microseconds and then end minus begin dot count. And then the program took percent LLD microseconds to run. Why LLD? Because it's a long, long int now, so we can't use percent %f anymore. We are going to use L percent %ld now. So that's the entire program using C++. It's more of a summary, and it's more of a summary, but if you this is built basically the same way as it was with the C program, it's just that we substituted certain things for their for their equivalent C++ their equivalent C++ features. So, you want to see that program? Of course you do. Okay, so I'm just going to close that. Um, save changes, don't save. And through the magic of video editing, I have already written out the program here. So it's all a matter of cut and paste. Clear the screen. Compile the program. Error. So what happened here? Okay. Hold on. Okay, so I test it, I run the code and I don't know what's going on that makes it Oh duh. You wanna know what the problem was? It was a C program. It didn't know what any of the C stuff was. Now it works. Dot slash civ. It's going to look for prime, up, prime numbers up to 100 million, and it took about 1.6 seconds to run. If I did that again with, say, 10 threads, it took slightly less time to run, but probably not by much. If I did it with 100 threads, then it took even more time to run. But let's try that 1 billion threads, 1 billion search marks again with 10 threads. This is taking some time. This is getting boring really quick now. <laughs> but this, it finally ran, and it took nearly 17, nearly 18 seconds to run. Let's try it 100 threads. Try it again. Will we get an even lower time? That took 17 seconds to run. Will this one take any less time? I can tell that OBS is struggling right now. Encoding overloaded. And that took about the same time to run. But if I did it with one thread, what will we get? This is taking a lot of time to run now again. I don't see any results on the screen yet. Did the program break? Or... 46 seconds to run. Wow. It took 46 seconds to run with one thread, but it took 17 seconds using 100 threads. 
I know that my machine can handle up to 1,000 threads. I'm not sure if OBS will agree with that, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Will I get an execution time that is lower than 17 seconds? Because the record to break now is 17 seconds. Is it gonna make it worse? Will OBS crash on me? It's a waiting game now. Thirty-seven seconds. So no, uh, one hundred threads did better than a thousand threads. Will fifty threads do better? At this point, and this is basically just me testing out the program. 50 threads also worked, and it got me an execution time of 17 seconds. So, for this example, the sweet spot for thread count when looking for primes up to 1 billion is around 50 threads. Any more than that doesn't seem to help. But 10 threads, if we only use 10 threads, then it's possible, but it, it's still possible for us to get some time of improve improvement. So, if you're willing to go this, if you're willing to go this far into uh, the insanity that is getting benchmarks, then you might want to modify this table to go up to a billion, and with thread counts that go up to one hundred twenty-eight, or maybe sixty-four. Let's do sixty-four. That all depends on how many threads your computer can comfortably handle. Because for my computer, what? I have an 8 core 16 logical processor CPU, and so I can only execute like what? So 16 threads at a time? So maybe this many threads might not help. So I'm gonna try it with 16 threads. This is all just like random commentary and just on the spot testing. Will this take 17 seconds or will it take slightly more time? Seventeen seconds. Okay, so at least for me, I think the at least for me with my computer as it is, I think I think I can only go up to 16 threads before I have threads waiting to go be executed by the CPU. So it might not be beneficial to run any more threads than that. If I want more parallelism, I think I need something else than just OpenMP. We either would need MPI or NVIDIA CUDA. Those are two other ways of getting parallel programs. So I was, so for the whole half of this, first half of the semester, we were looking at writing multi-threaded programs. It gets a, little, a bit more interesting when you look at MPI and NVIDIA CUDA. I would love to get into NVIDIA CUDA because the ways we can get speed up is like insane. We can use way more threads than just a measly 16, by the way. But yeah, that's for later. For now, this is the entirety of your midterm project. You are to answer these, answer these questions, fill out the benchmark table with execution times, and of course, you gotta have the sieve with which you can benchmark. And that's the whole project, right there. Alright. That's gonna be it for this video. It took, what, 55 minutes to record and several failed attempts of recording it before. But that is basically the entire 
project already. Everything that you'll be needing, hopefully, I've already described in this video. So, watch the video, scrub through it if you need help, ask me if you need any more help than that, and this is the midterm project, it will be due sometime on week 9. That's it. This is the, this is already the midterm project. I literally gave you all the code. Now the only thing that you need to do is run the program. That's it. You'll need to run the program a lot. That's all I can say. What are we looking at? What are we looking at after that? Uh, MPI and NVIDIA CUDA. So. I said I would also give out a homework regarding uh, chapter 4 that's on B-Threads. I think I will, if I am still to give you a homework for that, it will probably be after the midterm. But it's simply going to be a time how Using that, this knowledge that I have bestowed upon you, basically, I think the only homework I, ever, I would foresee regarding B-Threads is basically comparing how terrible a busy weight is to using a Mutex. But we'll see about that. For now, mission project. Here, are, this is basically all the instructions. I'm at it, and we'll meet again next week if I have any additional content to talk about. If everyone seems to be doing fun just fine on the midterm, then there might not be a need to make a week eight video, because that week is basically all midterm work. So that's it. See you next week, or possibly next week, and we'll take it from there. Thank you, class.